Thank you very much for the introduction, Lamy. Um, hi, I'm Mariko. I flew in from New York on Wednesday, so that was a bit of trouble. But um, <laughs> I want to talk about emojis, as Lamy mentioned. And I'm really interested in emoji because I was interested in communication to begin with. I studied communications as a major at uni and visual anthropology as minor. So like, I was really interested in communications. Um, only reason why I went into web development was this thing in 2008, well actually 2006, when I studied abroad in US, this, was this new thing called social network was happening. And I came in from like content and journalism side of like this new network thing is interesting, what is this? And then I kind of got into web from there. Um, that's my Twitter handle. If you have any questions or concerns or things you want to ask during the talk, please tweet at me. I'll go through later. <coughs> so as I mentioned, I'm really interested in emoji. And this is my um, emoji talk for this slide. And what I mean by that is I am really excited about emoji. Um, emoji doesn't, even though it coincides with like emoji and emoticon, emoji actually means e means picture in Japanese, emoji means letters in Japanese. So it's basically picture letters in Japanese. And as I mentioned, um, this, at least this form of emoji started in Japan. So for me, emoji was kind of natural thing. I grew up with it. It started when I was in like middle school, high school. Um, and when my Western friends started using emojis a lot, they had a lot of questions about why this is not emoji and why is this emoji. And I never um, like, understood, like, oh, people have a question about those things because it was like my native language that I didn't even realize that was a question. My friend in New York, who's the data scientist, saw that tweet and she made a Twitter bot of collecting people's reaction to why there's no such and such emoji. So you can go to this Twitter uh, and follow and then see what people are complaining about. And a lot of people complain to Apple. They think Apple is the one who defines emoji. Uh, and there's a lot of um, why there's no taco emoji tweet before taco emoji became official or Unicode standard. So if you're interested, I um, highly recommend checking that tweet account. Um, so what do we talk about for emoji? I want to talk, start with the history and context of how this thing happened in the first place. And then I want to talk about Unicode standardization, which kind of um, fast forwarded adoption in browsers and in phones and like all over the platform. And then I want to talk about how it's used and you know, how to code it, because after all, we were at a web conference. Before going into that, I want to define what emoji is for this duration of talk. As let me mention, there's emoticons. Uh, there's many other languages in the world that use picture and graph as a letter. But when I say emoji in this talk, I want to define that as like pictographic letters that is provided for communications. That is basic. What I mean by provided for communication means that user can use it. It is not that, uh, let's see, the tiny Apple logo that user never cannot. Uh, this is uh, letters actually registered as font, but us user don't have access to that thing. But emoji in this talk is the one that has a keyboard or the way to input it, and then we can use it for communication. So essentially, just think of that view for emoji. So emoji, where did it come from? If you Google the history of emoji, you might see this picture as original emoji, especially this week or as of two weeks ago because Museum of Modern Art in New York uh, acquired this emoji set as a design, part of the design collection. So there has been a lot of buzz about original quote unquote emoji, which was released in 1999. But if you dig through, granted you have to do it in Japanese, like a lot of like two hours Googling in Japanese will let you into uh, when emoji first started in this digital communication part. And I, I was able to trace back as far as 1997 when JPhone, part of the Japanese phone career, released our version of iPhone in 97. So this mobile phone in 97 was full on touch screen. 
and it supported kanji characters, which is big deal for Japanese. I, we have so many uh, character set. A lot of communication and computer device started with only supporting alphabets, and then gradually supports kana, and gradually supports a lot of kanji and stuff. So I took this picture from their um, PR um, press release, and here they say, we support kanji, and of course, emoji. OK, and then a whale emoji there. So that's like the first thing I can find. And even not even that emoji said, I was able to trace back pagers from that era supporting the heart mark emoji. And I was like in elementary school, so I didn't own the pager. So I don't really use it. I, I don't remember that being popular, but if I read um, the history and interview from back then, then they indicate that the device that supported the heart mark, being able to send the message with heart mark was super popular. That was like a deciding factor for the customer to decide like which phone career you're going to use. Oh, I'm going to have a contract with this career because they do, um, provide the device that I can use heart mark. So that's pre um, <clears throat> original emoji. But that original emoji set was a colorful one came from this mobile network called iMode by NTT Docomo, which started in 1999. So I want to talk about like this, like set the like a, a history of like what was like in Japan. So it was truly mobile first. So us developer in especially like Western country, we think like, oh, now like a lot of people are accessing website from phones. Not many people have computers and browsers. So really, uh, mobile browser is really important. But in Japan in 1999, that happened. And I steal the hashtag from Dojo project. <laughs> Dojo always has like, Dojo already did that for like JavaScript quirk things. <laughs> but I stole that for Docomo already did that. So imagine you are middle schoolers, just got into high school, and then maybe you receive a cell phone as a gift because now you are taking an hour train to go to school or something. And maybe you don't have access to laptop your own one. Uh, maybe your dad has one for business and you steal like a little bit of time from the internet or you go to library to use the browser and laptop or computer. But then on this era, if you buy those uh, Docomo cell phone, there's button I button, which you click on your uh, a flip phone, like 10 key flip phone, it opens up mobile browser and then it connects to the portal website. Think of it as like a Yahoo portal. So basically, you know, right there you have a search button, uh, field, you can scroll down, you can get uh, a train schedule, so you can get weather, like those kind of stuff. So just imagine that was like a new thing that started in 1999. iMode apparently eventually made it into UK. Uh, if you uh, Google iMode on Wikipedia, this is a picture you find from London Underground. And what was really cool about iMode was they decided to use packet uh, switching information system like what web browser does and HTML, supported HTML for content. At the time, there was a lot of phone people, uh, phone companies pushing for another set of standard called wireless uh, application protocol, WAP. And the people who was you know, trying to make iMode happen, especially this person coming from um, a lot of understanding content creators, he was like, I'm not introducing this new standard thing. Like, unless it is HTML like we do web, nobody's going to create a content for this. We are going to use HTML. And I think that's kind of important because iMode became really popular in Japan and mobile internet became popular in Japan. So in alternate reality, if you were a Japanese web developer, you might be coding uh, code for web and another code base for mobile. But because they thought that HTML is the way, now we can have like unified code base. So I want to point out this gentleman, Mr. Kuita, which did uh, two important uh, technical parts. So Mr. Kalita was tasked to do a few of the technical specifications. Um, he was a young person on the team. He was the one who knew how to use computer. He was not a developer, but he knew how to hook up computers and connect to the network and stuff. So, you know, when they decided to use uh, HTML, they were like, okay, define HTML and like, you know, write a specification for this browser. And he's like, okay. 
and this is the HTML spec. Now, HTML defined for full on computer browser and you know, the rich content. So not many things are applicable to this tiny, tiny screen with like limited bandwidth of the phone. So he defines things called compact HTML, which is a subset of HTML. It's so, I guess, for is compatible. Like if you do the uh, compact HTML website, then it can be loaded on the more full future feature web browser. Um, so he, in the interview, says, like, I didn't know anything, but I just read the spec and then, you know, think about, like, do I really need this stuff? No, if no, then I'm not putting it into the compact HTML. If it's, all, it's useful, then it put it into compact HTML. It's kind of amazing to think that somebody alone defined, like, one standard that was then used for, like, 10 years. <laughs> and another thing he did was um, pushing for use of emoji. So as I mentioned, he wasn't the developer to begin with. He started out of college, joined Docomo, and for a few first few years, he was selling those pagers and those mobile phones at the store. And he firsthand saw the user ex uh, experience, firsthand experienced that people were turning away from certain pagers or uh, contracting with Docomo because one of those devices didn't support heart mark to communicate on the pager. So he was like, this is a huge thing that people use in the communication. We should definitely have it in this new mobile network iMode. Another thing that pushed him was the idea of emoji was experience visiting San Francisco to see their version of mobile network, which called the PocketNet, which is, this is the, the word first mobile network, and I stole it from the um, TV commercial that was uploaded on the YouTube. But he went into San Francisco, write an email on this phone, send it to the office in Tokyo, make an international phone call, and then ask them, like, did my, uh, email like uh, alive on my office computer, and then it like, confirms that like mobile network is working. Um, one thing he noticed was that this one is like booking a hotel or something, or booking the flight, I guess. Um, one thing they noticed was when he was looking at the weather, it's just like output the text, so like Brighton, uh, Laney. Eight six or something, and he thought that it'd be great if we can use picture element like we see on the TV broadcast web weather forecast, like used icon to communicate those informations. So now there's a question of like, okay, so he saw the potential of using image in communications, but why did he go away to define a character and a font, not just use image? There is a little bit of interesting technical history around that. So first, iMode spec um, had the spec that the text and image has to be in the separate thread. So if you want to have a rich website that has an image, then that meant the browser is making a two so opening a two sockets connection to the server. That meant loading was really slow. Another one was iMode spec only supported GIF or GIF as an image format. And back in the late 90s and 2000s, um, there was a concern about pattern of the compression algorithm for GIF. So as Docomo being a huge phone company trying to make a new platform, there was no way they were going to engage in this potential pattern and potentially costing money problem. So he went into the maker saying like, what if all of the device that supports iMode has picture already in the hardware, and all I have to send is a code point for that emoji, and then the hardware will display the image. And the device maker who was prepping for this new platform was like, we can do that, but you have to specify the, the pixel by pixel how this picture is should be defined. Basically, the device maker who was making the hardware was like, I don't know what you're talking about, but as long as you give me the specification and the graph, then we'll do it. So now, him being like not a designer, not a, um, um, but like, you know, advocating for the communication, he had to draw a picture so that he can ask the device maker to implement it. So this is from recent uh, interview, him um, explaining the process that he did almost 15 years ago. And he's basically, yeah, I have a graph paper of 12 by 12 and try to like make sense of the pictures. Um, <clears throat> so finally, 
um, phone shipped with emoji, and this is the emoji interface from, I recall, I think this is 2000, um, the device when this was not, uh, the, the phone, call, phone was not yet full color supported, it was black and white. So this is the original emoji, and because it was um, registered in MoMA collection, he's been, the, the Kulita who designed, been tweeting about like background history, which I thought really interesting. So first of all, you have, you know, the weather emoji exactly as he imagined to be used. Uh, because they're making portals, they thought like, you know, the, the astrology, I guess, the, the star sign would be an interesting one for the content. So like all of the star signs there. Um, here, the train makes sense. And what is this M? This is M meaning underground, the metro. And he needed to make like the train and the underground icon, but he could not make a difference between those in 12 by 12. So he went with like literally just like putting M. Another one is like there's two versions of car. Um, slightly different size. And he recalled, like, at the time, I was really into snowboarding. So having this, like, a bigger car that you can, like, go to outdoor, I guess, call it an Avi, and then, like, a regular city car was like, a completely different thing to me, right? He was defining it. Um, another one, which, like, I did, I, I, up until yesterday, I didn't thought that was interesting, but a lot of people said that was interesting, was that these three hand signs, he designed it for lock, paper, scissors. Thinking, <laughs> thinking it might be um, use one of those like portal contents, and like I got a laugh, and I'm like, what do you mean? Like if you see those three signs, that's rock paper scissors, and again, like super fascinating. Um, oops, one thing that he says that he drew the inspirations from is this pictograms from. Tokyo Olympics in 64. So Olympics has this history of defining a pictogram for each game, but that tradition started when Tokyo Olympic happened in 64. And if you Google like Olympics pictogram, there's like a history of a design and like depending on where, which country is hosting the Olympics, they bring in their elements and it's quite interesting if you're interested in those design elements. But the Tokyo game also defined pictogram for facilities. Imagine this is like 60s, war ended in like 45 or something. And you know, Japanese, not quite yet even, but like not at all internationalized. No, not all the, the train stations had like English signs or anything. It was all in Chinese character or kanji, we call it, right? So they were like, how can we accommodate this like international people coming in for the Tokyo game? And they decided to use pictogram. And um, at, at least, Japanese likes to claim that we are the one who designed that bathroom sign for the women's room to be the dress lady, uh, human with dress, and then the human with not dress is the men's bathroom. Um, I try to make like a definitive case about like this was the origin, and then I found one article about like UK train system using this symbol around the same time, so I couldn't really see like which one is the first, but definitely around late 60s, uh, our bathroom sign that we know of was defined. And lastly, um, one thing that you might not make sense at all to you is these last rows of squiggly line things. And that directly comes from comic book. So Japanese have a very rich comic book culture, what we call it manga. And the way we communicate is quite unique. Um, American comics have their own style, Japanese comics have our own style. So you see these are the three characters there, and then you couldn't really tell the story of what's happening in this system. But if we add this like manga or comic convention of how to define the movement, then you started to see what this picture is about. Probably this is set in the scene that's dark because he ha she has the flashlights with this line going on indicating that's the blight sign. And then he's drunk because there's the blush line going on and like maybe his face is red. And then he's like lowering that arm because there is like swing sign going on. So like those are the things that might not make sense to you at all right now. 
But for me, or many Japanese people who grew up reading those conventions, make total sense. So if you go back, I can say like, oh, those are the sweat sign. These are sweat sign too. Those are like when like something collide each other. Those are when you are like moving really fast. And I can just like I, um, identify the symbols. So one thing you notice is that original emoji set is very minimal. It's not like 600 characters over like, I don't know, 12 pages now on iPhone. Um, and he tweeted recently saying, I didn't include any emojis that involves religion, nationality, race, and gender to avoid future conflicts. All of those emojis were produced by AU, which is another phone career. So when they were defining first mobile network platform and new ways of communication, they purposely decided that they were not going to provide those things because probably out of more conservative Japanese idea of like, we don't want to get in trouble, but they made the point that we are not going to do it. As he mentions, emoji get really popular. Mobile network and communicating with those picture elements became really popular. So many other phone companies started providing those service. And this is the result. So one phone career set is there. Another one is there. Um, if you enjoy those cat emoticon, not just like a regular emoticon, you can thank AU for providing those cat emoticon. That's the first. Um, somehow these limited countries, America, France, Germany, Italy, UK, China, and Korea receive their own emoji. And then probably you appreciate that one there, <laughs> which is um, poop emoji. Um, emoji got really popular in Western country when it got introduced to iPhone. And that is also have a story too. So when iPhone got released, uh, SoftBank, which is one of a phone career in Japan, had exclusive rights to sell iPhone. And they asked Apple to implement emoji because given the climate in Japan, they were like, unless you support emoji, we can't really like push sales because people are just like reasoning about like, oh, iPhone, that's kind of like smartphone kind of cool, but like you can't use emoji, so I'm not buying that. So <laughs> secretly, um, Apple released the emoji for Japanese market in iOS 2.2 in 2008, but then it was uh, worldwide supported at iOS 5, which is 2011. So some of the emoji that the phone career provided was like animated. <laughs> So this is like a locket emoji that's being animated. So it became a lot of variety. And that's like a little side note. You know, Docomo didn't want to make it into like a full set. They wanted to treat it as like just a font or letter. So Docomo, another like Docomo already did that hashtag, um, is a thing called Deco Mail, which basically is HTML mail that supports um, inline images, much like we do with Slack right now when you send the Slack emoji. And they also had a flash support. And I got into industry in 2008 and doing a marketing campaign for sending this deco mail was a big deal because essentially you could send a mini application over email to your customer. So like you can say like, here's a reward for such and such and then you can send a fresh application that like do tiny thing like, you know, um, a watch or I don't know, animations. Um, it was a huge deal. I thought it was quite interesting. So as I mentioned, there's like a lot of varieties, a lot of standards for different companies, which then introduced the problem. If you send a do uh, music note emoji from Docomo to the friend who's using SoftBank, this is a real case, it translated into poop. <laughs> and this one is the case that shows some kind of letters but then also introduce the problem of if you send some emoji that is not at all existent or not even like matching on the table, you would see saying something like those two bar that in Japanese we call a geta, or this, uh, you might see this now, the, the blank square that we call it tofu. So whenever you introduce, uh, whenever Apple introduced new emojis and that other platform haven't supported, you might see a lot of tofu now on Twitter or something. Google actually have a font project to resolve those problems, not only for emoji, but like if somebody is using special characters, they want to support those characters. So Google Noto font is a project to support as many glyphs as possible or like wide support. And it's directly come from this tofu, meaning no tofu, so no to font. 
Um, I thought that was interesting. So Japanese platforms use one type of encoding called shift JIS, uh, which, unlike ASCII, let us define wide variety of glyphs that we use, like so many of them. But then, because of the um, specification, we had a lot of space for empty one, too. And historically, a lot of platform implemented a lot of special characters in this um, blank place. Now, in late 90s, Japanese, you know, the industry was like, as a good practice, let's not use that space because that will introduce incompatibility issues between a laptop from NEC and laptop from Sony. Let's not use that. However, iMode used this space to define emojis, and so did other com uh, phone companies. And to me, as a developer, it kind of makes sense. Like, you are making new thing that nobody's done, and technically that's possible there, that's not encouraged. But, you know, just this once for our platform that is like very limited, we have a control over, we can use that space, right? So I feel like uh, there's like great hacker mindset or the, the programmer mindset, I can see that on the back of that. So eventually, it started in 99, and then like most of the phone companies started supporting emoji by 2000. So it took them six years to realize that this is the problem. People are sending incompatible letters, and the email doesn't make sense to each other. So the major phone career in Japan decided and agreed that they're going to um, map it map whatever their standard is so that all of the emoji have compatible, um, compatible between three major phone companies. What they did, or what they did not, even, is that they tried to unify the emoji. What they did was, we're going to keep our own code base, and then we're just going to create another map so that we can just convert it to each other, which, you know, maybe, but like, if some new company comes in and makes new browser, then they have to add another more and then another. So this is not like, you know, good. But they decided to do it. They invested in so much in their platform, so they decided to just make the map between them. So last big news for emoji in this history part is around 2008. So knock knock who's there? Hi, I'm Google. Can we get emoji into Unicode? Um, so Google led this proposal to add emoji into Unicode. Uh, it was official in 2008, but it looks like they've been working on since late 2006, 2007 on draft. Um, if you don't know Unicode, uh, a refresher is that Unicode is a project to assign code points and the name to each Griff any existing letters in the world so that we don't have to have incompatible uh, encoding system. If we say, you know, zero is A, then it's A everywhere. So they are the organization, the industry led um, kind of like default organization that is trying to do that. What they do is assign the code points to each letters, they na name them, and then they catalog the chart. So, like, um, if they see it, there is a number and what the name of that letter is, and then they see the, you, you would see the drawing of what that's supposed to be. It doesn't mean you have to use that drawing, but this is the guideline for what the font shape is. So why Google? Google wasn't in this like history play yet. Well, Google was working on supporting emoji for Gmail. Reason being, if you remember 2007, 2008, Google was pushing Gmail adoption a lot. I remember my university's uh, email system switched to Gmail around that time. Um, so Google going into Japanese market, they were like, we need to support emoji unless, you know, because like you want to send email from Gmail to the mobile phone and being able to display those things and vice versa. So Google designed their own emoji and it's like really small, but um, the color palette for each emoji is Google color, like yellow, green, blue, and red. I thought it's interesting. Um, but Google being working on those projects, and they were taking the same path as regular phone companies, like supporting a map, of exchange map of different phone careers. But then Google inside apparently has this Unicode organization to consider about those, and they were like, why don't you put it into Unicode? That'd be great. 
So before going into how this, a uh, little bit of uh, how the standard happened, I need to mention Unicode have um, association with ISO IEC 10646 uh, standard body, which defines universal character set. Um, Unicode itself is industry-led thing that you don't have, don't have authority, but they made an agreement with ISO to have a same character set in between those specification. ISO is international standard, so any country that participated in WTO is required to follow this standard. If you don't follow those ISO standard, then they might be problem with trade agreements. So by Unicode being affiliated with ICO, uh, ISO, um, whatever gets defined is kind of like a forced into a lot of users. And because it is associated, they need to closely work together so that it is um, a good for international standard. And this is the reason why there are three art emoji on different type of faces so that it accommodates um, a lot of people's um, perspective. Uh, this left one is the one that I think of as an art, but that might be different from the people who live in Africa, and that might be different from people who live in North America. So Google tried to put it in, and people had this like, question of like, is it even a language? Do we really need to do this? And Google defended, like, as with already approved ARIB symbols, the purpose for this adding is purpose for adding these symbol is interoperability. So Aleph is one other character set Microsoft advocated to put it into Unicode, which is a special broadcast symbol for Japan. So this um, left one meaning a hand sign broadcast, and then the right one is a closed caption broadcast, and there's many, many more of those. So Google was like, you did that for those broadcast standard too. We really need to ke keep the interoperability, so can we just please put it in? Which then, there's a question of like, do we really need this many book emoji? There's like four colors of book, just name like green book, blue book, orange book, right? And Google is like, yes, because if they unified it in Unicode code point, then the one phone career might support green book that may translate it into red book on somebody else, and that's incompatible. So they really pushed to put all of them. The case that they made to put it is this thing called CJK Unified Ideographs. So when Unicode thing was happening, they realized that in many Asian countries, there's uh, one single glyph, one single character, same meaning, but different way of drawing it. So for us being Japanese, for me, those like the, the dip line has to be dip and go up. But for Korean people, that's like straight. And then for Taiwanese Chinese, it's like horizontal. And to us, it's completely different thing, even though it is the same meaning, same letters. But to us, it's a different thing. And there has been different encoding and the encoding for those letters. So what Unicode did was like, okay, so source separation rule. Characters encoded separately earlier would remain separate in the new Unicode. So we're not gonna unify that as a one code point, but we're gonna assign different code point for them. So even though this was like in 80s, Google just like dig that rule, and then like, can we just apply that for emoji too? Another interesting one is uh, international symbol. Uh, those are the 10 that was included in Japanese phone system for whatever the reason. I don't really know. But probably this is like 10 most top, um, popular country in Japan, or I don't know. Uh, maybe product manager wanted those 10 sets. Uh, but they needed to put it in. So they put it in into Unicode mailing list. And people say, if there are going to be flag symbols, how about just including flags of other countries, i.e. Ireland, that regularly attend WG2 meetings. WG2 meeting is the ISO meeting. And this sparked a lot of interesting conversation. And if you like, if you're one of those people who follow like standards specification email and they're fascinated by it, this is really good threat to lead. 
Um, so they realized that flag is not a representative of country, and a flag may change, or flag might have like special political meaning that other country might not be happy with. So they switched the naming. Again, Unicode specifies meaning, or the naming too. So they switched naming from flag symbol Japan or flag symbol US to emoji symbol Japan as like this is the indicator for country. And they then realized that countries also like may change depending on political climate. So finally, they decided to define just the single letters of regional indicator symbol A, regional indicator symbol J, and by combining those two, represents country or region defined by another international specification. And on that note, they led that how to interpret those regional indicated symbol combinations are up to implementation. So in many cases, those are implemented to show flag, um, but doesn't have to be. Um, another thing that's interesting to me, as Unicode being associated with international standard, is uh, there was a heart, spade, diamond, and clover um, icons for emoji. And I learned daily get said, like, if you have those, why don't we just put like all of the deck of the card symbol so that people can use it, so that people can just have a heart ace and heart clover. So that got added to the emoji. And camel got added to this emoji set because a Japanese uh, emoji set had this 12 lunar symbol animals. Uh, we use those. But those 12 symbols are not necessarily the 12 symbols used in other countries that also use lunar symbols. For example, in Mongolia, camel is part of the 12 sets, but not in Japan. So those in part of the international standardization, they looked into if it's standard for international, and then they added new characters for that. Uh, of course, there has been a uh, discussion about, you know, potentially questionable emojis, like, you know, the ethic identifying emoji. Uh, it's not that they were not considerate and put it in or anything. Because it was already used to keep the interoperability, they put it in. Um, another one that's interesting, naming things is really important. So there has been the poop should be called something less slang, such as feces dot please, period. So reading those Unicode mailing lists is quite fascinating. Um, another thing was the emoticons. So um, through emo um, Unicode standardization process, they cataloged the character. So they were thinking, how should those emoticons cataloged? And okay, so as Japanese, again, thinking that manga notation, I'm like, okay, sweat, sweat, sweat. Uh, that's crying, the tear, and that's also tear. And some Japanese also thought that too. It's just a slight variation in those placement of the watermark uh, differs from being sweat to tear. So uh, Japanese volunteers got together and made this um, kaomoji generator. So what they did was separated out each of the parts that constructs the emotions in manga term, the comic term, and being able to mix and match to create a correct, or well, not correct, but like a, a familiar uh, emoticons and proposed it. And proposal for that is here. And they just like have, a, it's great reading material. They reference the manga and like what this symbol means. Um, if you're interested in those, highly recommend reading that PDF. Um, uh, then, you know, skin tones. Uh, skin tone is not one for a lot of people. So Unicode um, introduced this idea of skin tone um, marking. So if you combine one emoji and then uh, the, the skin tone, then it changes the color of the emoji. Another one is a, oops, um, a, a simple and emoji. So the phone emoji, there might be another phone glyph in some parts of Unicode that means same thing. So as application developer, you really want to specify that. You don't want to be misinterpreted. So if you add FEZLE after the phone emoji and that force to show the simpler version, the kind of like regular phone looking version. And then if you add FEZLF, then that shows graphical emoji version. 
Another one is combining emojis together. Uh, so they introduced this idea of Delois joiner, meaning this means I am joining those emojis together. So if you do women joining heart mark, that is emoji version of heart mark, and joining a kiss mark, uh, joining men, is women and men, you know, the, uh, the emoji that you're familiar with. And many of emojis, uh, new emojis are defined that way. So Google recently uh, introduced promoting gender equality through emoji, great post. And one of those things, like let's say, well, women programmer is women deal with joiner computer, and that's women programmer. So you could technically make ffconf emoji that is like supported in like some platform if you want to. Um, Apple actually did this by adding I and speech bubble and just like supporting in iOS for witness emoji, which was kind of active activist movement led by you know, private company, but Apple already implemented it, and some other platform also implemented that witness emoji. So Unicode literal actively registered that too. So if you want to start like a movement to new, have a new emoji uh, and don't want to go through Unicode, and, like, you can just make that too. So lastly, let's see how emoji is using it now. Uh, there's a great post about using uh, emoji in your code. And this, I think, is like the most basic use of emoji that the originator imagined, right? So like code has one single font and, you know, same color. It's a great way to add a kind of visual pop in there. Um, I, I got this from IBM's repo. There's like people who's defining how to write a commit message with emoji. Um, another one is the one used for uh, emoticons, right? So just adding the emoticon, you can specify what the, the meanings of your uh, communications is. Another recent one is replacing the text with emoji. So let's say this PR looks, you know, thumbs up uh, emoji, then that might mean good to go, or that idea thumbs up might mean plus one. It might be different. And Apple is advocating that. So now in the new iOS, if I seem thinking, then the speech bubble shows up. And if I tap on that, then it replaced my thinking block with emoji. So more and more, I feel like people will start using emoji that way. So lastly, if you want to code emoji in your project, how are people doing it? Um, what I see most commonly in, uh, in web is just treating that as image. I call it Twitter method. So just have replaced the emoji code point part with inline image. Uh, if you want to just keep that as a font and not send extra image, um, you can do that. And I recommend putting a span around it and then putting the area label so that it leads to the screen reader as you want it to. Or you might want to like annotate for humans who actually see the screen too. So you can use Ruby tag in HTML, which is a tag for annotation for um, Asian words. So as Japanese have a different leading method for the, uh, one single characters, to define that, we use those annotation tags. So you can abuse that or use that properly, I guess, uh, to mean like heart mark is love or heart. Um, you can do that. And if you want to make that screen reader read it for you, you could also put aria hidden for emoji part so that the screen reader just sees I love ffconf instead of I heavy heart, black heart, um, love ffconf. But that's a debate of like cheating screen reader by saying this is not visible on the screen. So that bit is a little up to discussion. So, as I mentioned, this is just the beginning, and emojis are now in Unicode and supported in many different platforms. I hope you use it, and I hope we can share the use case for it. Thank you very much. <laughs>